For many travelers, the state of Arizona is an essential part of their American Southwest journey. From its sweltering deserts to its snow-capped mountains, Arizona offers an unexpected variety of spectacular and unique places different from any other common travel routes. Arizona Hotspots introduces you to some of the most interesting places that are definitely worth a closer look. Arizona's topography has an incredible variety of altitudes and it is spectacular how many different climates originate from this. As we leave the Verde Valley with its countless mesa canyons and head north, we find ourselves in the middle of a huge pine forest. The dry desert heat cools off to a moderate climate here, bringing with it a higher chance of rain, allowing for the growth of a forest. Fire hazards are a big threat in hot summer months. Rangers perform controlled forest fires all over the state as their occurrence is a natural and necessary self-cleaning process of nature. Since the colonization of once uninhabited soil, this usually uncontrolled process became an enormous threat to the local settlements. Forest fires leave behind visible reminders for decades, leaving nothing more than burned stumps in their wake. As we pass the city of Flagstaff, a huge mountain range arises in front of us, which is much higher than the rocks and mesas we saw earlier. At 12,637 feet, Humphreys Peak stands as the highest point in Arizona and belongs to the San Francisco Peak Mountains, a local group of extinct volcanoes in the Coconino Forest. Humphreys Peak changes its appearance several times a year due to the natural changing seasons. Passionate photographers, or those who just love the beauty of fall colors, should set their trip in the fall, especially in the beginning of October, when the changing leaves are at their peak. Adventurous people should definitely take a trip to the Locket Meadow Campground. We highly recommend an off-road vehicle for the ascent, as its path is very rocky and steep. The Lockett Meadow Campground sets the borderline between the pine forest and the higher elevated aspen forests. Before the aspen trees lose their leaves, they turn the whole forest into a huge golden sea for about two weeks. That's quite a short time frame, but it is indeed a whole attraction on its own. During those couple of weeks, hundreds of photographers come here with their camera equipment and hike up the trail to the inner basin of Humphreys Peak. Aspen trees usually grow in the colder, higher regions of the Northern Hemisphere, such as Alaska and Canada. Their appearance in Arizona is an exception and mostly occurs in certain mountain ranges that reach a higher altitude. Their greenish white bark has a smooth surface and is marked by scars of dark brown. Regular aspen trees can reach a height of up to 82 feet. In case you don't have a proper four-wheel drive vehicle to get up to Lockett Meadow, the Aspen Forest can also be admired from the west side, which provides a well-paved street, a huge parking lot, and the Snowbowl Ski Resort, which in winter turns Humphreys Peak into a white paradise for skiing fanatics. Back on the road, we return to Route 89, which crosses the San Francisco Peaks heading north. Our next destinations? The Sunset Crater National Park, a 34-mile scenic loop drive along the San Francisco peaks, the Ponderosa Pine Forests, and the open Red Rock landscape of the Wupatki Basin and National Monument. That is quite a long list of tourist attractions. Since there is almost no civilization nearby, a fully fueled car is highly recommended. The loop itself can be accomplished within a single hour, but you would miss an abundance of scenic views and places of historic importance if you never stopped to check them out. 
Conveniently, the loop starts directly on the opposite side of the road that leaves the climb to Locket Meadow. As we head further east, we finally see much clearer evidence that the San Francisco mountains are actually of volcanic origin. Huge, rocky, and sharp solidified lava fields surround the mostly bare volcanic cone of Sunset Crater. Sunset Crater is a rather small cinder cone crater and the youngest among the San Francisco peaks. Its last eruption dates back to the later 11th century. Altogether, the San Francisco peaks count a total of over 600 cinder cone volcanoes. Scientists expect the number to increase over the next thousand years, most likely towards the eastern direction. Due to severe damage to the local vegetation by hikers, the walkable area around Sunset Crater was limited to a single trail at the base. Nevertheless, a few petrified lava canals can still be seen from a closer distance. Archaeologists assume that there are a large number of Sanagua pit houses buried under the petrified lava. Attempts to excavate these revealed that the former residents apparently had the required time to escape the eruption in time as there were no significant finds of tools or human remains. As the loop heads further northeast, the Ponderosa pine forest fades into a less planted area. Left and right of the road, a wide tundra stretches for miles and occasionally you'll see red mesa rocks, although not as tall as in the Verde Valley, rise along both sides of it. Encounters with wildlife and crossing tumbleweeds are no rarity. At the horizon, we can see the painted desert in the flickering heat. Although it can be visited, it is not a part of the loop. There are a few spots not too far from the loop that are worth leaving the main road. As we reach the Wupatki Basin, we can take the exit on the right to discover an impressive ruin called the Wukoki Ruins Complex. The Wukoki Ruin is part of the Wupatki National Monument. Wupatki means tall house in the Hopi language and defines the structure of a multi-story Pueblo dwelling erected by the Sinagua Indians in the 5th century. The settlement contained over a hundred rooms, a community room, and a ball court, which made it the largest ancient building for almost 50 miles. After the eruption of Sunset Crater in the 11th century, approximately 2,000 Sanagua Indians living at the foot of the volcano moved to the Wupatki Basin and marked the peak of its population. Not even a hundred years later, in the 1220s, the Pueblo was abandoned forever. As we reach the last third of the loop, we recognize a rather lonely group of ruins in the middle of nowhere. A small number of buildings at the foot of the hill and a bigger building on top of it named the Citadel draws our attention. Since its discovery, the citadel hasn't been researched completely. Its name mostly originates from its location on top of a hill, but its former purpose remains unclear. For all that's known, the citadel was built in the late 11th century on top of a sinkhole slope. Unlike Montezuma's well, the citadel sink dried out and left nothing but a crater. Droughts and depleted springs like this might be one of the causes why the Wapatki Basin was ultimately abandoned in the middle of the 12th century. The end of the loop is only a few hills away and we return to Highway Route 89 where the tour began. But there is still one destination left that has to be visited and it is less of an insider tip than a mandatory landmark on our Arizona tour, the Grand Canyon. As one of the seven natural wonders of the world, the Grand Canyon is a very popular location and is visited by almost 5 million visitors every year. The South Rim provides the widest range of accessibility and can even be reached by train. Visitors can use shuttle buses that drive along the rim from east to west covering countless panoramic viewpoints. 
The national park itself was discovered in the late 1900s and declared a national park in 1919 by President Roosevelt. It covers an area of approximately 1,901.9 square miles, has a depth of 4,600 feet, and dates back to an age of about 540 million years ago. Timing is everything. If you want to admire the full scale of the Grand Canyon, it is recommended to check the weather forecast. Nothing is more disappointing than to visit one of the world's most astonishing places to find it is covered in fog and you can barely see the other side. If you succeed, you will be rewarded with one of the most mind-blowing views imaginable. Getting to see the Grand Canyon in person is a moving experience that can never be replaced by a photo or a movie. Deep down in the canyon flows the Colorado River. Its meandering stream is mostly covered by the canyon structure, but some viewpoints offer a glimpse of the canyon's vein. For a short amount of time, the canyon was used for mining uranium. The few remnants of the orphan mine are fenced in and restricted to trespassers. As the day ends, you should not head home right away. The Grand Canyon has one of the most beautiful sunsets. In fact, missing it would be a waste of an opportunity to see the sun disappear on one of the Earth's most primordial spots. The Grand Canyon is a great place for adventures. Courageous and experienced hikers can dare the rim to rim to rim path, an over 47 mile long tour with over 20,000 feet of elevation and temperature differences of up to 70 degrees Fahrenheit. The rim to rim to rim expedition includes an exhausting hike to each rim of the Grand Canyon. Needless to say that this trip requires very thoughtful preparation and intensive training and should under no circumstances be hiked alone unless you are a professional. We have climbed up the 12,637 feet of Humphreys Peak, stared into the 4,600 foot abyss of the Grand Canyon, and discovered pre-colonial history between volcanoes and tundra. Nature has left a deep impression in our mind and we can't help but feel how small we are on our own home planet. In our next episode, we discover the deserts of the American Southwest and we will find out what really characterized the image of the Wild West as we know it today.